It is my second uh, uh, Polish von Mises Institute event and it is a true pleasure to be here with you to revive some friendships that started uh, some six years ago. And it is also a real pleasure to, to be today at an event, uh, the purpose of which is to better understand the ongoing euro area crisis. Uh, the ever-evolving and creative, to some extent, policy response uh, to the crisis has shown, if anything, uh, that its real causes uh, remain still ignored. I will contend, together with the previous lectures, that uh, the fractional reserve banking uh, and central banking are at the root of the economic uh, boom bust cycle. But my main goal here uh, will be to show how this same fractional reserve banking principle leads to further centralization and unification, as shown uh, by the recent internationally sponsored economic stabilization programs in a number of Euro area member states. To do this, I will first start with a stylized description of the present day monetary order. I will briefly present a few causes of instability, which leads to precisely monetary unification and intergovernment cooperation. And as a matter of fact, these are two aspects of one and the same economic process that could be uh, best labeled as monetary imperialism. And then within this analytical framework as a kind of application, uh, I will discuss the recent international assistance packages which were granted to Euro area member states and more specifically uh, there are three components, namely uh, structural, fiscal and uh, banking policies. So let me begin with the stylized description of uh, the current monetary order. Uh, it has two main features. Firstly, uh, independent national central banks produce fiat paper monies, which implies the existence or rather coexistence of multiple uh, paper money producers. Secondly, uh, fractional reserve commercial banks, by the way, heavily regulated by domestic national authorities, issue fiduciary media of exchange. So let me start with uh, uh, an explanation of the inherent instability of a fractional reserve banking system before I dwell later into the international implications of uh, papers money, paper money's uh, political nature. The first cause of instability in a fractional reserve banking system is due to the fact that a relative change in the demand for different types of media of exchange results in a nominal change in the aggregate supply of money. For instance, a decline in the aggregate demand for cash, also called base money, uh, is followed by an increase in the supply of bank credit and bank-created fiduciary media. Now, because banks keep fractional reserves only, the lower demand for cash, uh, precisely because it is typically offset by an equally higher demand to hold deposits, uh, creates extra liquidity for the banks. And this extra liquidity uh, serves then as a foundation for a bank credit expansion which is much larger uh, in size. Uh, in his early uh, writings on, on monetary theory, Friedrich von Hayek himself, uh, who is not typically known as a proponent of 100% uh, reserve banking, has described this process as, I quote him, the most pernicious feature of our present system. Now, a second important implication of this most pernicious feature is that uh, it disturbs the economic adjustment to relative changes in international demand. Uh, the heart of the problem is in the fact that a relative change in the spending pattern uh, has implications again for banks' liquidity and therefore for the total money supply through the money multiplicator. Thus, the market-driven adjustment to the new pattern of international demand uh, through the restructuring of spending and production is automatically accompanied uh, either by a contraction or by an expansion of the money supply. And this change in the money supply is acting as an independent cause for readjustment. And also it becomes uh, an international transmitter of uh, economic fluctuations through the impact uh, on the interest rates. The influx of liquidity in the country with a positive trade balance implies a multiple bank credit expansion, which compresses the interest rate below its market level. This triggers the well-known business cycle, which is the core 
of the Austrian monetary and capital theories. Entrepreneurs, to the extent that they do not anticipate the full consequences of the bank's induced monetary changes, are driven into an extension of the structure of production that is not sustainable given the existing pool of capital and net savings. And the end result is a physical impossibility to finish uh, all production processes which have been started. And most importantly, the loss of value for all non-convertible factors of production. In other words, this results in a general impoverishment of society. Third and finally, the bust phase of the business cycle is destabilizing the fractional reserve system itself. Uh, companies' bankruptcies lead to unrecoverable losses and to capital erosion for banks, which raises doubts about their own solvency. And the consequence is bank runs either from retail clients or from fellow bankers on the international uh, interbank market. This structural problem, which is embedded, so to speak, in the very notions of fractional reserve banking and bank credit, uh, has found a technical solution, so to speak, uh, in the institution of central banks, which act as uh, unlimited lenders of last resort. Now, however, uh, this short-term anti-insolvency uh, expedient, as it could be called, is effectively promoting moral hazard and therefore an even less conservative behavior on behalf of the commercial banks. And this is nowadays shown by the very low levels of cash reserves and capital. Now, not to say that central bank monetary policy, through its influsion of liquidity, uh, has become uh, the main modern driver uh, of the business cycles. Now, this calls for a further analysis of the economic instability that can be imputed to the very nature of uh, modern central banks. What is the distinctive feature of uh, uh, present-day central banks? Well, uh, it is their uh, political and privileged position uh, within the economy. The very framework in which paper monies are produced and introduced into circulation is fundamentally different from that of uh, commodity monies. Uh, commodity monies which evolve out of the direct voluntary exchanges are subject to the rules of what could be called horizontal and vertical competition. On the one hand, different commodities could be competing for fulfilling simultaneously the functions of a medium of exchange. Additionally, various producers of the same commodity uh, can be competing for offering certification services with respect uh, uh, to the different monetary objects in the economy. But even more importantly, the producers of any of the commodities which serve as media of exchange must compete in the context of general scarcity with the producers of any other good. Now, this implies that on the market, an expansion of the money supply is costly, as factors of production must be uh, bid up from other sectors. A and in this way, the price mechanism, through its influence on the expected relative profitability of business ventures, naturally regulates the quantity of money uh, in the economy, or would regulate the quantity of money uh, on the free market. Now, this natural regulation of both the production and the purchasing power of commodity monies uh, also ensures that uh, those who venture into supplying the media of exchange in the economy uh, do not benefit from a privileged position. Their income and wealth are positively affected if the demand for money rises relative to other commodities, including other media of exchange, of course. Uh, inversely, a negative income effect would occur uh, if competition intensifies or demand declines. Uh, so, in a sense, competitive money producers on the free market must cope with the uncertainty uh, related to the management of private property uh, and could occasionally even be driven out of business, exactly as in any other capitalist uh, venture. Most significantly, the fact that, the sub that they supply the economy with a medium of exchange does not confer on money producers any special status that would allow them to claim more of the aggregate output of the economy than what they would earn on the market. And they would earn on the market uh, as much as other property owners would voluntarily transfer to them 
through free and mutually beneficial exchanges. Now, with paper monies, things are altogether different. Uh, first, it should be emphasized that the acceptability of paper monies in the daily exchanges is rooted exclusively in the government's field. Uh, given that they have no non-monetary utility, and therefore no alternative source for valuation, uh, the foundation for ever accepting to hold paper monies comes from the legal certainty that any attempted rejection of the paper monies uh, will be defeated by the government. Uh, paper monies owe their existence to legal tender uh, regulations enforced by, uh, by governments. Now, this economic fact that we learn from value theory uh, is important because it underlines that states and paper monies share a common feature, namely their coercive nature. <clears throat> One implication of this political nature of paper monies is that their production and supply entirely escape the discipline imposed by the market. Uh, Competition-driven uh, cost considerations and consumer-determined return expectations are absent from the calculus of paper money producers. Indeed, the costs of producing one or ten units of a given paper money are all identical. This implies that the marginal cost of increasing the money supply is de facto zero. And this in itself grants a very special privilege to any paper money producer, namely the capacity to acquire for free goods and services already produced by others. To quote Rothbard, a paper money producer could consume without producing and thus seize the output of the economy from the genuine producers, end of quote. Uh, the supply of paper money is then involved in uh, nothing else but a special kind of exploitation, which could be labeled monetary exploitation, uh, just to distinguish it from uh, exploitation by means of taxation or uh, by direct regulation of the economic activity. And now this makes it clear why paper money production is always legalized, protected, and de facto controlled by states, which do not admit of any rivalry, as we know from Hans Hermann Hoppe, uh, in the exercise of their local monopoly of expropriation. So, given the lack of any natural, that is market-driven, uh, check on the quantity of paper money produced, uh, there is a specific question which is of particular interest, namely the question of the limits on uh, uh, the money supply. And as a matter, matter of fact, this is a problem with which money producers themselves uh, have been confronted. How should monetary policy be conducted? This is a very valid question uh, uh, for, for a paper money producer. Uh, and it is precisely in the light of this question that uh, the entire mainstream monetary research uh, of the past century uh, can be seen as an attempt to provide an answer uh, to this apparently uh, simple question. You can think of Friedman's K rule, of uh, uh, Taylor rule, of the optimal currency areas as uh, different answers to how should monetary policy be conducted. Now, however, I believe that the large variety of uh, mainstream de facto practical advice, you know, not so much theoretical developments, uh, has left uh, somehow untouched the, the very core of the problem. And the issue itself is not uh, uh, that trivial, uh, especially in the light of not infrequent cases of uh, hyperinflation. Uh, hyperinflation develops when expectations for a continual loss of purchasing power leads to a significant drop in the demand uh, to hold money. And such expectations arise when uh, monetary prices have been increasing already for a significant time span, which is itself the result of uh, major increases in the money supply. And the typical central bank response to this situation uh, is to further increase the money supply in order to address an alleged shortage of uh, banknotes and of uh, base money. This, of course, only feeds uh, even more the inflationary expectations. And the end result of this vicious circle is a galloping inf increase in prices, galloping inflation, and a, a subsequent deteriorating capacity for money to intermediate exchanges. <clears throat> and in this situation, 
<coughs> sorry, many users uh, typically spontaneously turn to the use of an alternative medium of exchange, either commodity money or in a world of multiple uh, paper money producers, uh, they turn uh, to an alternative uh, paper money. So from the outset, this would suggest that a paper money producer does not face any strict quantitative uh, limit on its paper money production, save maybe for the extreme risk of getting evicted uh, by other money producers. Now, this risk uh, is crucial, as a matter of fact, uh, from the point uh, of view of the state, as it implies a significant loss uh, in its exploitating capability. Uh, it also highlights an important limiting factor, namely the very existence of and rivalry between other paper money producers. The extreme case of hyperinflation also makes it clear that a paper money producer, despite all the legal tender legislations, ultimately relies on the individual's consent to accept its product. And this consent must be renewed uh, time and again, and it is always relative to the quality of services rendered by rival monies. Uh, indeed, any state which alone intensifies monetary exploitation faces either a gradual depreciation or a sudden devaluation of its currency relative to foreign currencies. And this very fact limits its capacity to further increase the money supply due to two factors. First, the loss of purchasing power means that a stronger increase in the supply of money would be needed uh, in order to yield the same expropriation effect. And second, uh, the public consent is significantly endangered when there is loss of purchasing power, and this could lead to a further depreciation uh, of the currency. <coughs> it is then clear that uh, the obstacle in front of a single state to expand its monetary exploitation is the very existence of multiple paper money producers. Uh, and the solution to this conflict situation is to deprive rivals of their capacity uh, to act independently. Uh, now, this does not only help the state to increase uh, monetary exploitation internally, it also allows it to grow externally and to enlarge the territory that it dominates. Uh, this tendency to expand monetary exploitation above the internal limits and beyond uh, the current political boundaries is best characterized as monetary imperialism. And this is a term that I'm borrowing from Professor Hoppe, who mentioned it in an article from 2003, and which was independently coined some 30 years ago by a leftist writer. Now, the concept of imperialism, I believe, is indeed fully justified, because the conflict situation persists, and the tendency to expand for a dominant money producer does not vanish so long as the last rival has not been deprived of its independent control of the money supply. Uh, in a sense, monetary imperialism is in the very nature of paper monies and can be seen as a specific expression of the general conflict between rival governments, in particular with regards to money production. Uh, as long as there are multiple paper money producers, I would contend that the policy of monetary imperialism could not be avoided. Uh, <clears throat> in addition, uh, the reality of this policy is guaranteed by the fractional reserve banking system itself. Uh, because they are regularly weakened by the bust phase of the economic cycles, uh, the inherently bankrupt fractional reserve banks drag the domestic states into bailing them out, uh, thereby significantly endangering its financial condition and capacity uh, to act independently. It follows that at any given moment, some paper money producers must be weaker than others. And according to a generalized progression theorem, which was formulated by Professor Hilsman, uh, political centralization and ultimate political unification uh, is in the interest of both the financially strong and the financially weak uh, political entities. Uh, so, the very same weaknesses of fractional reserve banks uh, that bring national central banks into existence also make sure that 
this centralization process uh, is fully completed uh, internationally. Uh, commercial banks might even uh, actively promote uh, the submission to a stronger foreign money, uh, paper money producer, uh, given that they critically depend on the reliability of a, a serious and uh, strong lender of last resort. Uh, I think we can identify two general forms of uh, monetary imperialism. One is unification and the other one is cooperation. Uh, unification results in the effective reduction uh, of the number of paper money producers. Uh, monetary cooperation is less uh, intuitive, uh, a more subtle case, so to speak, of uh, imperialism. Uh, as in this case, the number of paper money producers is not reduced, even though for all relevant purposes, they all act as one. Uh, and this broad classification uh, will allow me now to present a reinterpretation of the present-day monetary arrangements and to discuss uh, the recent bailouts uh, in the euro area. So with respect to monetary unification, uh, three distinct institutions that bring it about could be uh, spelled out. And these institutions are dollarization, uh, monetary unions, and the currency board. Uh, dollarization uh, occurs in cases of hyperinflation, when people spontaneously quit the domestic money and begin uh, using a foreign paper money of better quality. Uh, the domestic money producer is evicted, while the foreign central bank gains an extension to its uh, territorial monopoly. Uh, recently, uh, cases of official rather than spontaneous dollarizations have also occurred. In that case, an official agreement allows the otherwise evicted uh, central bank to keep some form of existence and to share into the seigneuriage of supplying the money supply uh, on the national uh, territory. And the most prominent uh, current examples of uh, dollarization include uh, Ecuador, El Salvador, Uruguay, Nicaragua, Kosovo, Montenegro, and most recently uh, Zimbabwe. Now the currency board uh, addresses this issue of sharing seigneuriage uh, by design. Uh, the setup of a currency board always proceeds from uh, an official agreement uh, by virtue of which the domestic central bank uh, declares that it will uh, produce cash bank notes and replenish banks reserves at uh, the central bank currency board uh, exclusively in exchange in foreign reserves. Uh, this is the reserve currency and this according to a predetermined uh, uh, fixed conversion rate. Now, from an economic point of view, uh, the domestic currency is no longer money per se, uh, but a simple money substitute, according to the Misesian topology of monetary objects, uh, a money substitute that is redeemable uh, in the foreign money. Uh, in this way, the currency board effectively transfers uh, the monopoly of money production to the foreign central bank. Uh, its own specificity lies in the fact that the evicted central bank keeps its physical uh, existence, while its economic nature is transformed from a money producer into a deposit bank. Uh, Real-world examples of currency boards, uh, such as those in Hong Kong, Lithuania, Estonia, prior to the adoption of the euro, and Bulgaria still, uh, have all operated uh, on the fractional reserve principle. Uh, now, this means that only a small portion of the foreign currency received by the board has been effectively kept in reserves, liquid cash. Yeah? The vast majority of uh, uh, the currency received has been invested in interest-yielding foreign currency denominated uh, bonds. And the yield on these uh, securities has functioned as a partial compensation for the lost seigneuriage that the currency board used to earn in its previous quality of independent money producer. And this financial benefit in the event of a currency board, if you compare it to a dollarization, also explains why currency boards have been so popular and uh, more popular than uh, dollarizations. Now, the third form of uh, monetary unification, uh, namely the setup of a monetary union, uh, is very, very close in practical implementation. Uh, should the single money of the Union be already produced by one of the member states, then the creation of a monetary union consists in official simultaneous 
and multiple dollarizations. If a new money is to be introduced, then the setup of the union must undergo an initial stage where the member states peg their currencies to the new currency. And in a sense, this new currency, which lacks a history of prices, and we know from Mises and the regression theorem how difficult it is to introduce a new currency. So this new currency must be born as a money substitute, uh, initially produced by a de facto currency bond. And the next final stage consists in interchanging uh, the nature of the monetary objects. So the money substitute becomes the real money and the previously existing monies become money substitutes, which eventually disappear physically. And the different steps of the European Union until the eventual physical introduction of the euro in 2002 uh, perfectly fit into this uh, three-stage uh, sequence. Uh, currently, uh, there are two projects for establishing currency unions, one from the East African community and another one from the Gulf Cooperation Council. Now, because monetary unions reduce the number of rival paper money producers, they allow for an increase in monetary exploitation. And the expected end result is higher inflation than otherwise, and a strengthened tendency uh, towards further monetary centralization. Uh, in a sense, monetary unions facilitate the less straightforward form of uh, monetary imperialism, namely uh, intergovernment and intercentral bank uh, cooperation. Uh, by coordinating their policy actions, that is by increasing monetary exploitation altogether, uh, the paper money producers eliminate the disturbing divergent developments uh, in the currency's purchasing powers. And thus, users' consent is better secured as less viable alternatives are left. Uh, in addition, and interestingly, uh, the permanent risk of bankruptcy of the fractional reserve banks encourages cooperation between paper money producers uh, on an ongoing basis. Now, assume that the central bank decided to remain conservative and not to expand the money supply together with the other central banks. Its money would then appreciate relative to the other currencies and would keep appreciating so long as users expect the conservative central bank to keep its more prudent policy. Because its money keeps purchasing power better, its international demand increases which would result into higher inflows of deposits at the commercial banks. Now, paradoxically enough, uh, the conservative central bank loses its capacity to control domestic banks' liquidity. Furthermore, a sudden change in users' expectations could reverse the international flows of deposits and cause the illiquidity of the commercial banks, especially and mostly in the case where they would have used these liquidities for granting loans either in home or abroad. And the attempts of the central bank to recover control over the liquidity of the domestic banks, for instance by a sterilization policy, would de facto imply that a foreign-induced monetary policy has to be followed. So the extreme instrument for insulating the uh, national banking sector from this phenomenon of hot money is to abandon uh, the conservative policy early enough, that is, to cooperate with the others. And the recent case in point is the decision of the Swiss uh, National Bank not to let the Swiss franc appreciate below 120 uh, francs for a euro, uh, a policy decision which, which was taken in July 2011 precisely because of uh, uh, significant inflows of foreign deposits uh, due to the appreciation of the more conservative uh, Swiss franc. Uh, from the point of view of the more expansionist central banks, so not the conservative ones, uh, it is also in their own interest to cooperate even ex post. In other words, to provide support to foreign central and commercial banks uh, in difficulty. Uh, a severe banking crisis in one country could undermine the stability of the fractional reserve banks elsewhere. And this is due to two factors. First, uh, uh, banks' balance sheets are interlinked through mutual exposures uh, on the internet, uh, on the interbank market. 
Uh, and the second fact is due to the very low uh, divisibility of confidence in, in banking. So despite their inherent rivalry, uh, paper money producers do share a common interest, and this common interest is the avoidance of bank runs. And this is precisely in this light that we can interpret the coordinated policy decisions taken on several occasions uh, between the five uh, major central banks since 2008, and more specifically the, the US dollar uh, euro swaps, which were meant to provide dollar liquidity to European banks, which were lacking uh, dollars. So monetary cooperation is uh, an instance of the general intergovernment cooperation, which can take a second form uh, of direct financial assistance through intergovernment loans. And this brings me uh, uh, to an analysis of these official loans, which have become very prominent uh, uh, in Europe. Uh, the structural weaknesses of the fractional reserve banks lead to uh, often unforeseen uh, bailouts, the magnitudes of, of which uh, cannot be known upfront, and which results in sizable uh, budgetary deficits. Now, this puts governments in a difficult financial situation due to the ever-increasing funding costs on, on the market for their securities. And beyond the point, uh, the costs become so high that governments decide to stop issuing new securities and to look for an alternative funding option. And such an alternative is uh, offered by the so-called official international assistance, which is typically dispensed either bilaterally uh, or most often by the International Monetary Fund. And the outburst of the public finances uh, crisis in the European Union uh, has led to uh, a wave of unprecedented uh, intergovernment solidarity, we could say, and which brought into existence a number of uh, specific and still evolving uh, instruments uh, for granting aid to uh, fellow members of the Union. And the latest of these instruments, uh, the latest in date, is the European Stability Mechanism, uh, which is a new permanent uh, European institution mandated to lend up to 500 billion uh, euros to Euro area member states. And uh, it is worth pointing out that this ESM evolved out of uh, pre-existing uh, balance of payment uh, instruments, which are still there and which have been used for members of the Union which have not adopted uh, the Euro. So since 2008, uh, 8 out of the 27 member states of the Union have received official uh, assistance. Uh, typically, funding has come from the IMF for one-third of the amounts, and the other two thirds have been provided by the relevant uh, European instruments. And the European Central Bank has participated in these official programs uh, in order to provide continuous liquidity to the banking systems. So once the total uh, loan envelope is determined, which is uh, done in a very uh, mechanical case based on the uh, rollover of securities over the next three years and the expected uh, deficits, uh, effective disbursements of the loans uh, take place in quarterly installments after experts of the lending institutions review uh, the policy uh, progress and uh, the implementation of the predefined uh, so-called economic stabilization policies. Uh, so the economic stabilization uh, program details specific policies and attached deadlines that the government must uh, follow uh, in fiscal, structural, and banking areas. And this is a de facto conditionality agreement between the lenders and the borrower. Uh, and the purpose of this conditionality agreement is to ensure that imbalances in the economy are corrected and that the funds are properly spent. So the overall impact of the official foreign assistance is determined precisely by this economic stabilization uh, program. And to properly understand it, uh, we must compare it to its counterfactual, namely how the fiscal and economic imbalances would have been addressed uh, without foreign assistance. In a nutshell, this counterfactual would have consisted in a market-driven restructuring of both the economy and the public finances. So to begin with, 
the government's funding difficulties would have resulted into a restructuring of its spending. Uh, expenditure cuts would have been simply unavoidable. Uh, the economic role of the high interest rates that private lenders begin to ask is precisely to signal the increased scarcity of funds to the government and to impose a lower expenditure pattern. Uh, now, a self-imposed correction, which would have been based on higher taxes, would not convince uh, the financial markets. <coughs> First, higher taxes would not address the structural problem that is at the origin of the high public debt. And second, higher taxes would undermine the future productivity of the economy and therefore the capacity of the government to easily generate additional revenues. The adjustment of government expenditure to the available tax revenues would also automatically uh, or would have automatically contributed uh, to addressing weaknesses in the economy's structure of production. A cut along all forms of subsidies uh, would have led to the bankruptcy of businesses which were artificially maintained at a cost for the taxpayer. And the subsequently released factors of production, including labor, uh, would have been redirected to sectors uh, where they would be better employed, even though at a lower nominal uh, remuneration. So a market-driven restructuring in government finances uh, would, in a sense, uh, have freed the economy from that part of the government's interventions which uh, the lenders on the financial market would have considered uh, excessive. The market-driven solution would also make the lenders aware of uh, their own responsibilities. Uh, beyond the point, uh, the restructuring of the government activities uh, would also include a rescheduling of the outstanding public debt, which would, of course, uh, have implied losses for the investors in sovereign securities. Now, such losses uh, would have resulted in an appreciation of the risk premium attached to public debt, probably on a permanent basis, and therefore uh, in higher yields asked for investing in public debt. And this is the ultimate sanction that would have safeguarded long-term discipline uh, in public spending. Now, against this background, uh, an official economic stabilization program clearly thwarts, so to speak, the national adjustment process. Uh, in essence, the cheap official funding uh, allows the government to maintain its overall size without scaling down. Nevertheless, because of the reality of the uh, imbalances, uh, which could have been hardly denied, the necessity for adjustment is fully recognized both by the official lenders and by the borrower. But now that the market-driven correction is precluded, the adjustment must take the form of administratively decided uh, uh, and implemented policy actions. Now, in a sense, I believe this uh, sheds new light on the nature of the so-called conditionality, which is often presented uh, as a means for, for avoiding the buildup of uh, moral hazard caused by the cheaper than the market uh, funding. Now, conditionality appears uh, to be uh, much more fundamental and implied in the very notion of intergovernment support. Because the market is not there to help the adjustment, the adjustment must be done uh, in a centralized and administrated uh, manner. And in addition, uh, it is quite clear that uh, if you look at the historical record of conditionality, uh, it has hardly prevented uh, a moral hazard. Now, the, the key problem with uh, an administratively decided uh, stabilization program is that it is uh, trapped in an inescapable uh, contradiction. On the one hand, the provision of sufficient financing to cover the government's funding needs over the next years reduces the urgency to adjust public finances. On the other hand, the policy conditionality itself is rooted in the awareness that an economic adjustment is much needed. And here there is a fundamental contradiction uh, that leads to very low incentives to implement unpopular reforms. Now, it also implies that in practice, an official stabilization program is unlikely to succeed. 
the official creditors do not have sufficient knowledge uh, of where the imbalances originate from. Uh, it is not enough to point at excessive public deficits and debt. Uh, one must also find which government programs and policies are at the origin of the unsustainable spending. And this is a knowledge that uh, I believe uh, rarely anybody possesses. Uh, at the same time, uh, the, assistant govern the assisted uh, governments have little incentives uh, to sort out uh, their finances and to terminate uh, uh, practices that create financial holes. Why would the government uh, fight bureaucratic resistance if funding uh, is, after all, available? So the typical response to this uh, knowledge and uh, incentives problem is to impose only a very gradual correction path on the general public debt and to subsequently adjust the conditionality requirements uh, to the effective progress uh, made by the governments. Just to give you an example, uh, the implementation of the, of the policies is followed quarterly by experts from the IMF and the European institutions. Uh, this conditionality is uh, written down in a specific uh, memoranda of understanding or a memorandum of economic and financial policies. And, and the purpose of the quarterly review missions is twofold. Uh, one purpose is to review how far the government has gone in implementing uh, the conditionality. But the second purpose, of course, is to adjust the conditionality uh, to, the, to the new situation and de facto uh, to the level of implementation. So uh, there is a very uh, perverse link between imposing conditionality and modifying conditionality based on effective progress. So in a sense, while uh, some broad expenditure cuts are uh, imposed, it is fundamentally up to the borrowing government uh, to specifically identify them and uh, to implement them. So let me now uh, examine the, the, in some further detail the, the economic consequences of uh, the intergovernment support programs. So from the outset, uh, an official loan implies the bailout of holders of public debt. So these are domestic and international banks or other investors such as pension funds, insurance funds, which of course also have exposure uh, to uh, commercial banks. And because the official loan reduces uh, the likelihood uh, for losses by private investors, the market price of public debt does not decline as much as it would have otherwise. So an official loan uh, contributes to maintain the value of assets of investors in public debt above what their portfolio uh, would have been in the case of a market-driven restructuring. It produces a counterfactual redistribution of wealth from taxpayers to the government's creditors and most notably to the fractional reserve banks. Indeed, in fine, the official loan is to be repaid out of future taxes. Hence, an economic stabilization program implies stronger future taxation, that is, a heavier government weight on the economy. This is the exact contrary of the counterfactual market-driven solution, which would have resulted in scaling down the size of the government. An immediate first-round impact of uh, an official foreign loan is to increase the liquidity of the domestic banking sector. This is due to the fact that part of the additional funding is spent on goods and services, including publicly employed labor, offered by residents. And as the government spends more than it would have spent otherwise, uh, revenues of state-employed factors of production are higher, and so are, of course, their owners' deposits at the commercial banks. And the banks, which are the ultimate beneficiaries of the increased liquidity, can use it for repaying their own creditors or otherwise improving their profitability, for instance, by expanding bank credit. In a nutshell, a foreign-funded economic stabilization program is fundamentally inflationary or anti-deflationary. Even when it is nominally limited to supporting the government alone, it still contributes to refinance all debt-based relationships created by the fractional reserve banking. And given that uh, these official loans prevent uh, local episodes of uh, deflation and thereby contribute to global inflation, uh, we can uh, definitely consider them uh, as 
put in place as policies uh, which uh, find their origin in uh, monetary imperialism. The specific economic policies that accompany the official loan uh, fall in three areas, uh, fiscal, structural and banking. Uh, in the area of fiscal issues, it is required that the government gradually reduces its deficit over a number of years, typically three years, to a level which is considered uh, sustainable. Now, this sustainability is uh, determined very mechanically based on some growth projections and the subjectively uh, determined acceptable level of public debt. Uh, in the European Union, prior to the crisis, uh, the sustainability threshold for public debt was uh, put at 60% of the gross domestic product, but since the crisis, uh, it has uh, de facto doubled. Uh, similarly, deficit requirements are not determined anymore in terms of effective nominal targets, uh, but relative to so-called structural targets, which of course allow for uh, cyclical slippages uh, in public spending during the bust. And finally, only part of the deficit uh, correction comes from expenditure cuts, uh, uh, an equally popular and maybe even more popular tool uh, have been uh, uh, tax hikes. Uh, and b because these official loans typically result in increases in taxation, uh, uh, they have become an effective tool uh, for uh, international tax harmonization. And uh, the fact that tax optimization opportunities uh, for businessmen are reduced is a clear benefit uh, to the foreign credit states, uh, which now also have the leisure uh, to be able to increase uh, taxes higher, given that uh, tax evasion opportunities uh, have been reduced. Uh, the so-called structural policies uh, relate to uh, the fundamental conditions of uh, conducting economic activity, such as uh, labor legislation, pension arrangements, state monopolies, uh, protected professions, or different trade barriers of any kind. And the required adjustments in these areas are meant to increase the economy's overall productivity and compet competitiveness. The goal is to generate sufficient surpluses that would allow timely repayment of uh, the overhang of foreign debt. Uh, however, uh, it must be pointed out that structural policies also extend the notion of uh, efficiency uh, to areas such as tax collection, public finances framework, and again, tax evasion. Uh, so while stru structural policies do introduce higher economic freedom in some sectors, they also lead uh, to a generally uh, stronger government. Uh, in addition, uh, much bolder and genuine reforms uh, would have been implemented had the national authorities not received an official foreign loan. Quite often it is alleged that the conditionality attached to the loan is the best opportunity for domestic politicians to carry out and implement reforms that would have lacked uh, social support and public consensus without the intervention of the international institutions. I believe, however, that uh, this argument wrongly compares the structural reforms under the loan agreement to the situation prior to the government's financial difficulties. And uh, this argument also ignores the, the, the impact, the very impact of uh, the cheap official uh, financing. Finally, uh, the third policy area uh, of an official uh, program covers the banking sector. Now measures here aim at ensuring that banks are adequately capitalized and provided with sufficient liquidity. Undercapitalized banks, uh, whether effectively at a given historical uh, moment or in light of expected losses uh, over three years period included in the stress tests, uh, receive state-funded uh, capital injections, which are financed by uh, the official foreign loan. Uh, now, in the event where the undercapitalized uh, bank uh, would be deemed non-viable, uh, restructuring and resolution are applied such as dividing the bank into two institutions or consolidating it uh, with another entity. Now, there is no need here to go into the detail of all possible banking sector restructuring measures, 
uh, what we have to point out is a common feature. The common feature that must be recognized is that the fractional reserve principle of modern banking is maintained, while accidental changes to the business landscape uh, are voluntarily accepted or sometimes even uh, imposed. And the end result is that the banking sector is even more regulated, supervised, and de facto controlled by governments. Now, this summary of the uh, stabilization policies required by a foreign official lender shows that uh, genuine problems are being addressed by health measures. Even though some benefits could be expected in the long run from some of the structural policies, these are immediately offset by increased government involvement in all areas of economic life. And as a consequence, these administrative programs are bound to yield poor economic results. Now, of course, these poor economic results quite often, and already this has been the case, are quickly used as evidence for the need for further government involvement. And this can be seen as an uh, application of Mises' uh, interventionism uh, uh, theory, where the failure of one interventionist measure uh, calls for a corrective second intervention. Uh, so uh, there is a very perverse dynamic, so to speak, in these f official uh, programs, uh, th the lack of success of which is uh, feeding further government involvement uh, in economic life. In a nutshell, these economic stabilization programs promote anti-free market uh, sentiment. But I believe we can go a step further and uh, even claim that their macroeconomic uh, consequences uh, are fundamentally anti-reformist. Uh, first, uh, the economic conditionality attached to the loan uh, delays and even precludes uh, some critical reforms. Uh, second, uh, the loan brings about a generalized bailout of all creditor to debtor relationships and, most importantly, an increase in the money supply. And both of these tend to maintain the social and economic statu quo. The higher future taxes, uh, which are the necessary implication of a foreign bailout, put a burden on the future wealth to be produced by the economy, that is, on the younger generation. At the same time, the current owners of wealth, much of which has been accumulated in an unsustainable way due to the fractional reserve banks, are mostly shielded from bearing the losses. In this way, a bailout de facto hinders innovation, free entrepreneurship, and precludes the natural renovation of the economic elites, which a market-driven uh, restructuring would have uh, implied. Now, these conclusions are strengthened uh, when we consider what would have been the specific impact of the market-driven restructuring on the banking sector. Uh, the unavoidable cuts in government spending would have resulted in a lower income for state-employed factors of production and subsequently in lower liquidity for banks. This would have led to a lower capacity of the economy uh, to reimburse debts, to a surge in the non-performing assets on banks' balance sheets. These are things that we have seen, but most importantly, uh, on the free market, so to speak, uh, we would have had uh, also as a result uh, the, the need to acknowledge uh, these, these losses, to, to, to fully uh, bear them. And this would have resulted in a strong contraction of the money supply. This, as Mache pointed, would have contributed to amplifying banks' own difficulties and most certainly uh, to uh, eventual bankruptcies. The fractional reserve banking system, in a sense, would have imploded in such a deflationary environment. And I believe that the main macroeconomic achievement and purpose of uh, an official foreign loan is, uh, has been to avoid precisely this outcome, uh, namely to make sure that the money supply does not contract and that banks do not go bust. Uh, the end result uh, is that financial instability remains embedded uh, in our system despite uh, all the official attempts to limit crisis. So the preservation of the fractional reserve banking, uh, which I believe 
should be seen as the, the very rationale of the intergovernment cooperation, uh, continues to build up uh, additional uh, imbalances, and of course, as a result, promotes further cooperation and uh, monetary expansion. So, to, to sum up, uh, my goal here was to show how the structural instability of uh, fractional reserve banks, uh, presumably shielded uh, from bankruptcies by the central banks, becomes the main driving force of a process of uh, monetary uh, centralization and intergovernment cooperation. Uh, I tried to present the recent euro area crisis as an empirical illustration of this process, uh, which is conveniently described as uh, monetary imperialism. Uh, the official policy response to the imbalances, rather than addressing uh, the root cause of the crisis, keeps uh, the statu quo. It implies that the economy will be further weakened, which will result in renewed calls for state intervention and further policy uh, initiatives. Uh, and thus, the policy of monetary imperialism, in a sense, persists and grows out of uh, its own contradictions. Uh, now, this conclusion, I believe, is important because it uh, highlights the crucial Austrian insight, which we'll discuss to some extent later tonight, uh, that in order to achieve uh, international stability, the main component of uh, monetary reform must be uh, the banking reform. Thank you. Okay, some 10 minutes for questions, so in case. Do you seriously believe that in case of market, uh, market driven uh, uh, resolution or, or, or whatever you call it, uh, there, would be, there would be a push towards uh, um, setting aside or, 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 or extinction of fractional reserve banking? Yes, fractional reserve banks some of them would have to collapse. All the depositors will become the owners of the banks. So nowadays we are in a situation in which people believe that they are depositors, while as a matter of fact they are uh, lenders. Yeah, but the institution for the banking have been in place for, for uh, tens and hundreds of years, regardless of the, of the financial crises and, and, and these um, international bailouts. Yeah, so what we have now as international bailouts is basically the expansion of these uh, domestic bailouts for which the central bank uh, has been put into place in the first place. So, so I see this really as a further process of centralization as of growing imbalances. You see, so indeed, I agree with you that uh, uh, historically, uh, the failure of uh, uh, fractional reserve banks to honor uh, their claims uh, have resulted in political calls to establish uh, an entity that will uh, bail them out. We, th this is how we explain in Austrian economics the dematerialization of money, the appearance of the central bank, and uh, its bailing out actions. I fully agree with this. Uh, and uh, with the accumulation of imbalances and, and this process of um, uh, monetary imperialism, as I described it, uh, we have a growing uh, ne next stage where the bailouts are conducted not only at the national level, at the domestic level, but at an international level through cooperation and so on. So uh, I do agree with, with you that historically there is a little chance to see this happening. Uh, my point was just to compare theoretically what would have been the alternative uh, in the event of lack of any intervention, national or international, uh, in this area. I think the end result, if there is absolutely no intervention, would be a discovery uh, of the fact that the deposit contract nowadays is mixing two natures into one. Depositors, de facto, are lenders uh, as if they were uh, cre regular creditors to the bank. And part of the imbalances in the economy comes precisely from the illusion uh, uh, from which depositors suffer, that they are not creditors to the bank, but precisely and only depositors. Um, the end game of monetary imperialism is one central bank, one global central bank with one money supply, correct? And the way you analyze it is in terms of the benefits of doing this to the individual central banks today. Uh, Basically, just putting on the aggregate the, the micro analysis we have with individual fractional reserve banks. 
I wonder if you can comment, um, because there's some costs involved as well, and for example, uh, right now we've got competitive devaluations by central banks. It seems to me that you have uh, examples where they would prefer not to be cooperating uh, and not join, uh, not want to be coordinated together. So there's almost, there's a cost involved here as well that central banks might want to exhibit their own monetary nationalism in contrast to this imperialism. Yeah, so if I understand you correctly, you would say that some uh, uh, industrial interests within the the domestic territory w would prefer uh, to keep the currency for their own interests, the management of the domestic currency. I, I get the point, but maybe this can be easily offset uh, by direct subsidies from the government. Huh? Uh, right, I mean, the, the competitive devaluation is basically a forced redistribution from all uh, the domestic holders of the currency uh, through uh, to uh, some industries, uh, which benefit from a positive income effect. Uh, it, it's a disguised subsidy. Uh, so so uh, maybe uh, this, this cost and uh, possible opposition to uh, uh, monetary unification could be uh, offset by a direct government subsidy. Yeah. Well, almost certainly as in the case of uh, the Eurozone, where there is individual uh, national central banks that would like to devalue and would like to exit the Euro, at least they say this, but we're offsetting it through fiscal transfers. Through fiscal transfers, exactly. I would say more on the international level that you have an example of, say, uh, the Bank of England and the Bank of Japan, the Fed and the ECB, all in some way trying to competitively devalue against one another. Right, to gain a competitive advantage in the export market, especially in the case of the Bank of Japan. And they would prefer not to be coordinating these efforts because if they do, then uh, not everybody can devalue at the same time. Same time, yeah. No, I, I get your point. It's an interesting point. So, again, I would say that fiscal transfers could solve this issue. But uh, interestingly enough, I mean, all these banks now, central banks, have started to exchange their own currencies. They, all of them, they have credit lines. Uh, they have repos, swaps. Uh, so I see this more as an, I mean, it is interesting that you bring this uh, as an instance of uh, competitive devaluations. I would see their actions uh, more as uh, co cooperating actions, but probably they are both. Huh? So they are different aspects. Uh, so yeah, thanks for bringing this. Uh, I will ask a question. Uh, yes, what do you think of this uh, new proposal of uh, banking resolution reform in your opinion is like a step toward more market-oriented restructuring of banks? No, I would take it as the other way around. So the, the, the reason they... Uh, so, so this... Uh, the, the European Re Resolution Authority and the European Resolution Fund are two parts to, to be implemented in the coming years of the so-called banking union the first element of which is the single supervisory mechanism, which will start next year, uh, by virtue of which the systemically important banks in the euro area will be supervised directly from the European Central Bank. Now, for the resolution fund, the idea of cre I mean, the, the idea in the, behind the, the, the policy, uh, in the heads of the policymakers, is to break what they call this uh, vicious circle banking crisis, public debt crisis. Uh, because national governments are uh, or have been called until now to bail out uh, failed domestic banks, the banking crisis has resulted, according to some, into the public debt crisis. And the idea of the resolution fund is to break this vicious circle, which would mean uh, that uh, a euro-wide or euro-area-wide uh, fund will be used to uh, refinance uh, failed banks at the national level. Uh, so it is not the Greek taxpayers which would uh, be called upon funding uh, the Greek banks, but taxpayers throughout Europe. Now, uh, economically, what can we expect? So this, this would be a way to uh, implement uh, um, centralized uh, or euroized public debt, so to speak. Now, uh, the end result uh, will be a moral hazard, I believe. Huh? Uh, even less responsibility and even uh, less, uh, uh, even more abuses by the national authorities 
from their national banks to fund public debt, uh, domestic public debt, because the ultimate uh, payer, uh, uh, the, the costs uh, uh, for uh, expanding the, the domestic public debt will be borrow, uh, uh, borne by, by the foreigners, uh, will be distributed throughout the euro area. Uh, but uh, does it not also include like uh, changing like uh, not seeing your debt in the uh, equity on the Ah, so you're referring to something else here, uh, which is uh, the way in which uh, banks in need of bailouts uh, will be uh, funded. So indeed, this is an initiative which would go rather in the in the right direction. Uh, so banks, uh, before public uh, funds uh, would be uh, provided to banks for recapitalizations, uh, there will be a hierarchy of the contributors. First, uh, the senior bondholders, sec uh, uh, sorry, the junior bondholders. Second, the senior bondholders. And third, uh, in to some cases, it's quite vague there, uh, large depositors. Uh, to some extent, this would go in the, in the right direction. But then, of course, it would be uh, also contradictory with the uh, single resolution fund, which will be set up out of public funds. Why would you need a single resolution fund if uh, you uh, uh, announce and uh, imply already that uh, future ba uh, bank recapitalizations will be done primarily by uh, private funds. Uh, there is something strange there for me. Uh, and uh, the only way I can make sense out of it is that really the, the, the policy response uh, coming uh, uh, from the policymakers has been extremely uh, contradictory the last years. On the one hand, uh, they, um, they want banks to... Um, the leverage because they see imbalances. On the other hand, they want banks to get involved into uh, providing credit to small and medium enterprises because otherwise growth cannot be restarted. Now, you cannot have one and the other at the same time. So this is just another instance of how the, uh, the, the policy response goes into two uh, contradictory directions. And how do you find the role of uh, fiscal treaty in this uh, public mm, Cosmetic. Um, I mean, fiscal treaty is not an innovation. Uh, uh, we, uh, I mean, th there were uh, principles before for maintaining fiscal uh, st uh, uh, discipline and responsibility, but they failed. There was uh, the, the, that uh, six pack. The six pack, yeah, there are a number of initiatives and one is losing sight of this. And after uh, they write six pack, they started to work on this Like always with, with these uh, uh, elements, uh, if you read only the, um, the big lines, it all looks very fine. But when you start to look all the exemptions, for instance, the deficits are defined in structural terms. So again, uh, the deficit limit in the six pack is in structural terms, which allows for cyclical slippages. And this is led to the uh, subjective appreciation uh, uh, of policymakers themselves. So uh, there are a number of initiatives which are believed are there uh, to calm financial markets, which go on paper to the right direction, to implying more uh, fiscal uh, uh, discipline. But when you look into the fine uh, print, uh, I have my doubts uh, as to the capacity of these uh, legal initiatives uh, to, uh, to lead to, to more discipline. So you do not believe that uh, all these regulations uh, uh, inside European Union like six-pack and uh, uh, above European Union like this property, uh, you do not believe that it could be effective? I have my doubts. These are definitely uh, initiatives in the right direction again. Uh, but why do I have doubts? Well, the big doubt is that this is again administratively solving the issue. The issue uh, can be solved on the market if one respects uh, uh, its obligations with respect to, to, to debt and to, to repayment. <laughs> and it reads a bit like central planning in determining the, the qu uh, quality uh, of your uh, finances. Uh, if you compare this with a private individual, uh, well, you determine uh, your uh, the state of your indebtedness based on your expected income, uh, your capacity uh, uh, to increase it. Uh, it's not, I mean, a kind of economic approach uh, to uh, your indebtedness. Uh, these policy initiatives 
uh, completely discard uh, the possible economic regulators of public indebtedness and go for an administrative uh, uh, solution. That's why I have my doubts that this uh, can succeed. And historically, as we see, the master criteria were permanently abused. So why would now new criteria be respected? No, why do you uh, criticize uh, focusing on structural deficit? Because the structural deficit uh, is an artificial construct. The, the real deficit is the difference between your spending and uh, income. Uh, you can uh, de uh, design the structural deficit uh, in many ways. I mean, th this is an artificially constructed uh, uh, concept. Okay, uh, you, you have to take out the so-called so uh, cyclical component. How do you determine the cyclical component? You, you, uh, by a change in the methodology, I can show you that you have a structural surplus while you're, you have a deficit of 30% uh, based on your uh, receipts. I mean, uh, you take a deficit of 10% to GDP in Spain, this is basically 30% more than uh, what the Spanish government has as receipts. And I'm more or less confident that by, by some methodology I can show you that the Spanish government has a structural surplus. Your colleagues in the European Commission count, uh, count it, so how do they count? I don't know. These are big methodologies. I'm not involved in this at all. Uh, Eurostat uh, has methodologies, I do not know, but this makes me only more suspicious. Okay, uh, thank you for that question. Uh, still, you can use different methodologies to have big deficits, still, you can use different programs, so it's something like structural. Uh, my point was that the real variable is the difference between how much you get and how much you spend. And this is the only thing that matters. Then you can uh, provide different explanations to this. And, that, uh, and uh, basically uh, the, the distinction between structural and cyclical is a justification of why you spend so much. But the, the major point is that you spend too much. Why? That's another matter. We can discuss it. Uh, and in the legal documents, uh, six-pack... Uh, the, 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 this kind of justifications are already embedded. This is the only thing that I want to say.